Turn to 1 Samuel 16 this evening, 1 Samuel 16, and we're going to begin in verse 1, 1 Samuel 16, and uh, God has been so good to us, good day, huh, the baptism services, and uh, good to see Justin back tonight, uh, most people get baptized or join, and then you never see them again, so no, I'm just kidding, but good to see Justin this evening, and uh, Olivia uh, singing up front tonight, and uh, seeing God's work in her heart, as well as Andrew uh, Flynn. And thrilled to see what God's doing in uh, hearts and lives for His glory and His honor. 1 Samuel 16 tonight, if you'll join me in standing for a moment, and let's begin in verse 1. And we'll look at uh, most of this chapter together, at least in an overview, but let's read through verse 7 to kind of launch our study tonight. 1 Samuel 16, and let's begin in verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Feel thine horn uh, with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Verse 4, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord is anointed as before him. Now notice verse 7 key verse tonight. But the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or uh, on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. So tonight we've been studying through the book of 1 Samuel. If you're here for the first time or by way of review, looking at godly influence and how God can use us to be an influence. And tonight we want to look at this subject, the heart of influence. And this is kind of really um, a key text in this whole book. This is a key study tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your goodness tonight. Thank you for your will for our lives that, Lord, does not begin on the external. Um, as we studied even in our adult Sunday school class this morning, Lord, it is not behaviorism. It's not what we can mechanically do. But, uh, Lord, it is truly um, what your Spirit produces on the inside and uh, Lord, what that produces as a result on the outside. I pray that you would help us tonight to see where we are qualified and where we are disqualified currently uh, in the area of our heart, and uh, Lord, to learn from the example of Saul and his poor example, as well as the example of David, and Lord, from it, um, to put a higher priority on um, where we are at with you on an internal level. Bless this study, be honored in how it's taught and preached, and how we each hear it and live it out this week. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, there was an interesting story, a sad story in the news this past week of a, I guess it's been maybe a week and a half ago, of a rugby player. I don't know if you remember this story that occurred initially several years ago, but a rugby player who was in the backyard with some of his buddies and uh, on a dare ate a slug out of the garden behind their home. And at the time he was in high school, and uh, just this past, I guess it's been a week and a half, that young man, after eight years of battling, the ramifications of that health-wise passed away. And they were interviewing his family and some of his closest friends, and um, they said the result was because he ingested this slug, this just slimy creature in his back garden, he actually contracted, after lots of testing, what is called rat lungworm. And it got inside of him, and they really don't have a lot of antibiotics or other things to treat that because humans rarely contract that disease. And so after eight years of battling that, it left him basically as a vegetable. Um, as far as mentally, he wasn't able to talk or converse. He was just barely functioning toward the end of life, and uh, he passed away. Now, can I just say this evening, what's inside of us matters. What's inside of us that's good, what's inside of us that's not so good um, really defines who we are, and not just as in our identity, but also our ability to have influence. What is in your heart tonight is what's influencing people around you. And that is both a sobering truth, but that's also a really exciting aspect of our relationship with the Lord. If I can get my heart where it needs to be, 
um, that passion, that purity, that pursuit of God will rub off on others. And tonight I would submit to you that the godly leader, as opposed to the whole let's just follow our heart, go with the flow crowd, the godly leader knows that what's going on in the inside between them and God really matters. And uh, here in 1 Samuel 16, we see that truth uh, fleshed out for us as God, prior to this, the Israelites had chosen a man after their heart, and that didn't turn out so well, did it? He was an egomaniac at times, he was a, a proud man, he was a rebellious man. But now we find in 1 Samuel 16 that God picks a man after his own heart. And so tonight, for a few minutes, we want to look at what we can glean from this little shepherd boy, this young man that God handpicked, not because of the external, but because of the heart-level relationship he had with the Lord. The question tonight is, in a world that so values the superficial externals, how do we stay focused upon our heart-level relationship with the Lord, which ultimately calls us and qualifies us to be a part of leadership? Let's look at tonight two enabling attributes of a heart for God, that if we have these things, uh, it will enable us to be more for the Lord in the area of leadership. And they stole my pulpit tonight. I don't even know. Where's it at? Do you guys know where it's at? Oh, it's over here. My clicker's over here, too. Um, let me give you a couple of thoughts tonight uh, in the area of influence as it pertains to our heart. The first one is, if you want to jot it down, is number one, first of all, it gives to us qualifications. It qualifies us. It enables us to be what we need to be for the Lord in the area of qualification. Um, as Saul rebelled against God... In his rejection against God, um, Samuel was commissioned to seek out a new leader, one who was qualified from God's perspective. And when God panned the crowd and when he looked at the nation of Israel, he looked for someone who was qualified on a heart level, a man after God's own heart. Hold your place there in chapter 16. Quickly go back to verse number 14 in chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13. And earlier when God told uh, Saul, you've lost the kingdom, your, your influence is... Uh, on the way out, he alludes to David in verse 14 of what he is going to look for and what quality will qualify the next king of Israel. Look at verse 14. 1 Samuel 13, 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue, Saul, he's speaking to him, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul had gotten a new heart. Remember that? We talked about that. He had a change of spirit, and for a time there seemed to be robust, sincere, authentic fellowship of God. But Saul compromised on that. He abandoned that, and so God looks for a man after his own heart. And so the qualification for leadership begins with our hearts. I don't know what you think of when you think of, I'm a leader or I'm not a leader. You know, I'm someone who's qualified to be a leader or I'm not qualified. But the place that God starts is not all the veneer and all the external things. He starts with where we're at and a passion uh, toward him or away from him. So let's talk about a few areas that our heart enables us to be qualified for leadership. Number one, first of all, your heart qualifies you despite often what is viewed as inferiority. Your heart for God qualifies you to lead despite what others would say is inferiority. Can I give you two of them that are found in reference to David that I think if someone had glanced or we had looked at David, we may have tended to view him as being inferior or lesser and not qualified to be a leader. Look, if you will, first at verse number six. All right, and here are two inferiorities of David that we see referenced in the text that I believe caused Samuel and others to overlook him. And it came to pass, when they were come, they looked on Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, notice this, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Can I give you two areas of inferiority, not on the, on the slides tonight, that I think a heart for God overcomes? Number one, inferior stature. Inferior stature. Um, we were at the Moors uh, two weeks ago for a small group, and the Brother Andrew, pray for him, he's out of town still for probably about a week uh, on a work trip to the state of Maine. Uh, fun time of the year to go to Maine on a work trip. He's had rain and I don't know if snow or not, but uh, he's it's slowed down a bit with weather that he's there. And so we had a small group. The last week Andrew was home at their house, and our small group has been going well, and we've enjoyed uh, our time with those in our group. They've ministered to us. 
But uh, before he left, Mandy had him fully decorate the house for Christmas. So I'm talking like Halloween hasn't even happened yet, and we are celebrating Christmas. And so we were giving them a hard time. Trees are all up and manger scenes. And it just, you know, and so we were joking as we were leaving, man, I'm going to be cranking the Christmas carols all the way home as I drive back from Maslin tonight and just processing that. Um, Christmas is about upon us, and I, one of my pet peeves is getting ahead of Thanksgiving. I don't know if that bothers you, but it's amazing. Uh, my wife's in retail, and uh, they're already moving on to Valentine's Day at this point. But it just everything just <laughs> progresses so quickly. Um, but the other day, I heard someone talking about, I don't know if this resonates with you, but someone said, no matter how old you are, an empty Christmas wrapping tube is still something fun to bop someone else over the head with. It has a really cool sound, doesn't it? And then they turn and grab another tube, and pretty soon you got this thing, I have brothers, so we, we would do those kind of things. But have you ever had someone rub you on the head? Oh, good little boy, good little girl. And there's almost like a dismissiveness to that. Um, I think David, if he had been here in verse 6, if it were comparing between Eliab and David, David would have been the one with lesser stature, not just physically, but also just his profile and others, what they expected of him. He was the runt, if you will, of the litter. And so in verse 6, you will notice, and I find this striking, isn't it interesting that Samuel, I hope you understand, the book of Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel, does not portray Samuel as impeccable. Um, he made some of the ma- same mistakes with his sons that um, his predecessor had made. Um, and uh, we see that. But I find it interesting that Samuel evaluates Eliab based on the same standard of the king who just failed. Isn't that interesting? In verse 6, he looks at his stature. That was Saul's main qualification from a man's perspective. He was head and shoulders above the crowd. And right away, Samuel gravitates again to this man, Eliab, not thinking of anything beyond his kingly profile. He forgets what has just happened in the nation of Israel. And so we see that we gravitate towards stature, but God does not. And you see in verse 7 that God says, look not on his countenance. Don't look at the outward appearance. God doesn't look there. God looks uh, on the heart. And I think the language is clear here. In verse 7, God says, I'm going to pick. You're not picking. The people aren't picking. I'm going to choose a man that is after my own heart. Now, just this word of application before we move on. God does not look for leaders the way man looks for them. Um, I don't know if you've sensed that in our church, but our church is not consumed as we look for leaders. We're not looking for those with certain educational or economic or whatever backgrounds that some in other uh, settings would look or say they're qualified or not. I believe you have to start with the heart. Now, good intentions are not enough. We understand there's more to it than that in spiritual leadership, but if the heart is not right, nothing else matters. Um, We're not made up of big givers and high-profile, edumacated type of people Um, Our desire is to be a church made up of people with a heart for God. That's the only sustainable model that God can bless. And so we see that that's both encouraging, and that encouraging that God chooses people based on our heart, but it also is very sobering. Because I, I can control my heart. God can search my heart and purify my heart. Therefore, if I'm not a leader, that's a choice I'm making. That's a choice I'll answer for as we're emphasizing choices um, this fall. And so it's greatly encouraging that God looks at the heart. You don't have to have some big stature or profile, but it also means any of us can lead. Any of us can have influence for the glory and honor of God. All right, secondly, go to verse 12. And notice a second inferior aspect that some would have dismissed David. We'll come back to the interluding verses in just a moment. But verse 12, Jesse sent and brought him, David, in. And notice now this description of David. This is the first time we see him. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Number two, not only was he inferior in stature, but he had different skin. And I mean that in the sense of he looked different. Um, He was not the normal. He was not the average. He was distinct. He was different, different skin. So inferior stature and different skin or different exterior profile. Um, I don't know if you've noticed in our day, but we struggle to make eye contact. Um, I've noticed that um, because of a lot of technology. Um, one of the things I work at with my boys, and I'm sure you do with your kids and grandkids, look at me in the eye. Look at them in the eye. Look up when you answer. Look up when they're talking to you and, and making that eye contact. And uh, recently someone said, in 20 years, I bet there will be a college course called Making Eye Contact. 
It'll become something we have to teach uh, to learn again. And I think sometimes we look at one another or we think God looks at us the way uh, we look at ourselves or at others. God sees much deeper. Not only is beauty more than skin deep, so is godly influence. Um, God looks beyond that. So as David walked in, it uses a few words to describe him. It says that he is ruddy. And the language here seems to indicate that he possibly had red hair and fair skin, which um, I don't know how much you know about Middle Eastern folks, but that's not the typical profile of a Middle Eastern, of someone living in this region of the world. And so he looked a little different. Um, The word ruddy also is used to refer to Esau. In fact, David and Esau are the only two men or people in Scripture referred to as ruddy. And it also has the idea of of outdoorsy or hairy or rough or manly. And so um, this word at least is used to distinguish David that he is ruddy, unlike his brothers. Maybe his skin color, maybe his hair color, maybe his profile was a bit different um, than that of his peers and of his brothers. Now, I think just a quick takeaway from that would be being a leader means you have to be different. Um, to just be, to blend in, you can't lead from that position. I'm not saying you can't work with people and seek to be accommodating and aligning with people, but to lead means you have to be comfortable in your own skin. You have to be comfortable with how you're wired and how God has gifted you, not in a sinful way, but being distinct. And so we see David just stepping into the room in a unique way. God sees him and God tells Samuel, this is he. All right, number two. So our heart qualifies us <laughs> despite our inferiority. And maybe others think less of you. Um, you think less of yourself. Get a heart for God. Let God use that to overcome those inferiorities. All right, number two. Your heart qualifies you despite obscurity. Um, just, uh, obscurity. I don't know if you feel like nobody knows you're on the planet. Nobody looks to you for influence or guidance. You're kind of just in your own orbit. But I think David would have described himself as that, someone that nobody even remembered, nobody even noticed. How do we know that? Let me give you two obscurities that are overcome by a passion for God. Number one, the obscurity of being marginalized, being marginalized. Um, In verse 11, you will notice it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all thy children here? Samuel had said, Gather your sons. And so they go through the whole lineup, and none of them does God choose. And so Samuel says to Jesse, um, just to be thorough, is, is this all of them? Are all thy children here? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Keepeth the sheep. Um, Sluggles were gone on vacation uh, a week or a half or so ago, and they posted this picture of Lil Kenzie. Did you see this picture online? Um, and her hair is wild. I think she, I don't know where it's like, did she just wake up right there, I think, in that picture? Um, being the youngest is cute for a while, isn't it? That's a cute picture. But I guarantee there'll be days someday if Kenzie is the youngest and the Slegel's long-term that she will be picked on. Uh, She will be marginalized in the best sense of the word, even by loving brothers and sisters. Being the youngest tends to be something um, that over the long term is dismissed or marginalized. Now, when David says here in the text, um, or when Jesse says, um, the youngest remaineth and he is with the sheep, that status was not a positive. It wasn't, oh yes, and we're saving the best for last. Youngest meant in this economy, you were the furthest from the birthright. That meant you had no chance of anything. You were, you were the least significant and important. The rest of your brothers have to be taken out before you become of any standing in the family. Um, also, the fact that he was keeping the sheep, that was not... Um, a, 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 a coveted position um, in this economy. Sheep were viewed in a, uh, a negative fashion oftentimes. And so we see him marginalized. We see him set to the side. He is forgotten in this important moment. Can I just remind you that God's repeated pattern is to use the youngest in the family? And I could go through a list of them. I give you just a few. Abel, uh, Jacob, uh, Joseph was one of the youngest. Now David, someday soon Solomon. He uses Uh, the insignificant. He uses the marginalized. And maybe tonight that's you. You would say, no one one knows me. No one's impacted by me. Develop a heart for God that helps you to not be permanently defined by the marginalization that people direct your way. By the way, it didn't really matter the birth order of David in the family. It was the fact he was in the right family. This was the family. This was the family of promise. This was from these Uh, This lineage would come the Messiah. 
Uh, and so God had a reason to send Samuel to Bethlehem, this city that someday would be the birthplace of the Messiah. He had a reason to come to the house of Jesse, uh, who was the uh, descendant of Ruth and Boaz and would become the forefather of Jesus Christ. And it, David was in the right family. And can I just encourage you tonight, no matter how you're marginalized, you're in the right family if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. You have a place of influence. You've been called to be salt and light, salt and light of this Savior. And so uh, being marginalized should not hinder our relationship with God or our ability for Him in the days ahead. God does not choose His next leader from those assigned as acceptable or on the rise by man. He often does the exact opposite by handpicking leaders that others are dismissing. Um, I read a quote the other day I thought was good. Someone said this, People who achieve, leaders, collaborators, and innovators, don't wait for permission. Those who achieve, you read biographies, you read of men in scripture, you read of people in even business, they don't wait for permission to be successful. Since when does your potential, is it determined by what others think of you? What about what God sees when he looks at you? What about what God has planned for you? Are you willing like David to persist in it to be all that God wants you to be? Don't wait for permission to achieve what God has called you to achieve. All right, so he was marginalized. Then you will notice in verse 11, it says, secondly, not only is he the youngest, but notice, behold, he keepeth the sheep. Got ahead of myself just a bit. Number two, he was given menial or insignificant responsibilities. He keepeth the sheep. This position was typically given uh, not to the next up-and-coming leader. This was given to the sideshow. This was given to the insignificant individual. David was forgotten. He wasn't deemed worth inviting to this feast. He was forgotten. Now, what did David do with that responsibility? Can I give you just one little window into that? Go to the next chapter in 1 Samuel 17. And look at verse 20. Just a little verse. We'll come to the story of David and Goliath here in a week or two. But I, I draw your attention to one little verse that seems just to, you almost just read over it when you're reading this great text, one of my favorite chapters in Scripture. But look at verse 20. Long before David meets Goliath and deals with that struggle and that battle, notice what it says in verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. David, no matter what else was going on, he was responsible with the most insignificant task. Someone who loves God doesn't care what God has entrusted to them. They do it to the best of their ability. And we see David right here, and even this text, a foreshadowing of his responsibility and ownership of what God had given to him. Quick example of that in the New Testament. We'll go to Colossians 3. Would you for just a moment? I think we have time to look at it. Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 22. Colossians 3 and verse number 22. This idea of, of not losing heart when we are given something that is viewed, at least in our eyes or in others, as a menial or insignificant task or responsibility. Colossians 3, and if you will please, verse number 22. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22. See, a heart for God can qualify us to be a leader despite how obscure we are and what we're stuck doing that seems so insignificant. And we see how that happens uh, in verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to... Uh, to the flesh, notice this, not with eye service as men pleasers, notice this next phrase, but in singleness of, what's the next word? Heart, fearing the Lord. And whatsoever you do, do it, what's the next word? Heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's a leader. Um, and I have been in work settings. I, I told my wife just the other day, we were somewhere, I forget where we're at, but I love to go to obscure places, some gas station late at night, some fast food place, or some uh, hotel front desk where no one's aware, and they meet you with a smile. Everything's done professionally. I wish I could hire those people just to do something great. You know, I'd love to do that for a living. Find people doing obscure things that got a passion for it and elevating them to a position of responsibility. I love to see people with that spirit. That's a leader. I've been in many more settings where it's half shod, they don't care, there's no passion. Is that happening in our church? Is that happening in your family? No one knows, so who cares? People with a heart for God do it no matter who knows, because ultimately it is unto the Lord. And so that's a leader. 
overcome where you're obscure today and where you're living in obscurity by doing what God has given you with all of your heart. By the way, in this place of meaningful responsibility, David became that man after God's own heart, and he penned the words, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. As a shepherd, he had a window into God um, and his care and his concern, and God taught him things in that setting that he couldn't have learned in a palace. He had to learn on the backside of a mountain watching a group of sheep, and nobody knew, but God met him there, and he developed and grew in his heart for the Lord. It's not the high-profile responsibilities, but the lowly tasks. Listen to me. It's the lowly tasks that allow us to demonstrate our heart for God. It's not the ones everybody sees, the ones where nobody knows that really that's where we show whether we have a heart for God. We do it well. We do it thoroughly. We do it with a passion uh, as unto the Lord. Leaders with a heart for God see no task as beneath them, and we see David clearly embodying that spirit. All right, number two, go back to our text in 1 Samuel 16, and notice the second aspect of the heart (laughs) that qualifies us or allows us to be in leadership. So it qualifies us uh, when the heart is right, despite areas others would say we're inferior or we are obscure. And notice, if you will, now verse 14. All right, so we'll come back to verse 13 in a moment. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubled thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Now notice verse 18. Then answer one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing. And a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Number two, in our hearts, not only does it qualify us, but number two, it makes us distinctive. Distinctive in heart. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the speaker was saying this. He said, quote, uncentered leaders produce unsettled followers. Uncentered leaders produce unsettled followers. And those who lead well and those that work for them or follow them or submit to them or partner with them, uh, when they are most settled is when their leader is most centered. This distinctiveness of heart, centered upon God, centered on His will, not always moving and panicking and reacting. Now, we don't have time to go back through all the text, but in this chapter, other hearts are doing other things. In verse 1, Samuel's heart is mourning. In verses four, uh, verse 2 and verse 4, the residents of Bethlehem are fearful. Um, in verse number 14 that we just read, Saul's heart is troubled, but David's heart is centered. He sticks out in chapter 16 because of only one qualification, one quality, and that is his heart for God, his passion for God, the, the way that he did and carried himself as a result of that heart. And so a heart for God distinguishes us in our areas of influence. The only thing that produces authentic, sustainable distinction as a leader is a heart for God. You can try to stick out and be distinct in some way for a while, but that wears thin. It's only a heart for God that's sustainable as you seek to be a witness and influence for the cause of Christ. All right, let's talk about a few areas that our heart helps us be distinctive. Number one, first of all, your heart for God distinguishes you through preparation. Your heart for God distinguishes you through preparation. How many of you in the room tonight, you enjoy uh, pumpkin pie? You like pumpkin pie, all right? Any of you hate pumpkin pie? All right, a few of you? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, a few, no, I'm just kidding. Give them a hard time. Uh, the, uh, can I just say this evening, pumpkin pie is good when a lot of time is invested in it. When it's done half shod, um, as some maybe do, and this is probably the worst example of it. Did you hear about this at McDonald's? You know, there are pies they have coming soon, or maybe already there, Pumpkin pies, one for 89 cents, two for a buck 50, I think is what I read in the article. Now, can I create a scenario for you that emphasizes the value of preparation? We have praise and pie coming up. Uh, is that a week from tonight? Yeah, wow, one week from now. Um, next Sunday night, you walk through the line and you see two options uh, on the table when it comes to the pumpkin category. Forget the cheesecake, the guy with the cheesecake thing. He's always bringing that up. Um, but two options. You have these, or you have the most gifted 
baker in our church who poured hours into prepping the, the crust with its flake. I know I'm going to lose you when I describe this in too much detail. The flakiness and some of the, just the way it's presented, the little crack in the middle that you know just it's cooked perfectly. Which would you choose? That, two of those, or a little sliver of what I just described? I'd go with the home-baked one every time. Preparation matters. The same is true with our hearts. I think sometimes we forget the value of preparing our heart, of structuring and investing into our lives this baking with love, if you will, disciplining out of our lives the desire for fast food. Fast food is easier, but it does not compare taste and quality and healthiness many times, maybe sometimes not to that, which is baked with love from the heart. And so we need this preparation in our lives to honor the Lord. All right, let's talk about where we need to prepare based on and modeled after David. Go back to verse 14. Did you notice that? So you see this, Saul is struggling with this spirit from God that troubled him because of his disobedience. And notice if you will in verse 18, it says, uh, verse 17, Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answer one of the servants said, behold, I've seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehem height that is cunning in playing. Jot down, first of all, number one, we need to prepare, or two preparations that are fueled by a passion for God. Number one, we need to prepare musically. We need to prepare in our worship. We need to prepare in our worship before the Lord. While David was being prepared for office, Saul had this punishment and this vexing from God, and God used what had been prepared uh, to give him a place of influence. Now, can I just say this? Long before David ever played for a human king, he had learned to worship and praise before the king of his heart. It wasn't Saul that, that evoked and was his muse that brought out of him this musical ability. It was God that had done that. Long before any audience had listened, before anyone had been moved or spiritually stirred by his worship and praise and giftedness, he had prepared before God alone. You ever been a leader with a leader who is doing what God has called them to do, and you can tell that they have prepared with God and in God's sight long before they ever talked to you or tried to impact you? I've also been around leaders that have not done that. I'm their audience. I, I'm their agenda. May we prepare ourselves before God to become the leader that God wants us to be. Why? Because this requires faith. The God who does not see as man seeth is the one to whom we must first learn to worship. All right, notice the end of verse 18. It says, it uses these other descriptive words of David, a mighty valiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Number two, David was prepared not only <laughs> musically, but politically. I find it interesting that it says he is a mighty, valiant man, a man of war, and prudent in matters. And so we see that he is being prepared for the position ultimately that God will give him. The qualifications of David were first rate. He looked the part, he knew the music, he was a skilled warrior, he was quick to learn and to comprehend, and most importantly, the Lord was with him. He was poised and ready when God was ready to make him the next king of Israel. Now, can I just say this? All of those things listed at the end of verse 18, God gave to David the rough building blocks of those abilities, did he not? He didn't determine what he looked like, he didn't determine some of his musical ability, but he developed those things. And I think we would do well to spend more time in our passion with God to prepare and sharpen our tools and uh, to be poised for what God will do publicly when we prepare privately uh, before Him. By the way, any abilities or assets that you have are not for your agenda, but for the advancement of God's kingdom. These were going to be used for a kingdom. These abilities, these preparations that He was investing Himself in were for the kingdom that God was about to begin. All right, Matthew 6. Can I bring that into the New Testament for just a moment? Matthew chapter 6, and let's look at verse 31. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Familiar verses, but I think we would do well from a heart position uh, to practice these more fully. Matthew 6, and let's begin in verse 31. Talking about why should we prepare. Um, and this is a, maybe a pet peeve or a soapbox of mine. I have to fight not to get up on every, every time I, I'm able to. But I think preparation matters. Preparation precedes poise. Um, if you have responsibility in this ministry, I don't think you should be five minutes beforehand trying to slap something together. Um, now and then maybe something happens and that's all that you can bring. And I think God in his mercy and grace understands that and will empower that. 
the preaching, the music, other areas you have influence in our community uh, needs to have preparation. Those with a heart for it don't need to be told that. You know that's, that, that's a part of it. Look here in verse 31. It says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's what their heart is for. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it's about seeking with our hearts. Now, go back to earlier in the text. I hear those verses quoted often. But earlier, look back at verse 16. This idea of the heart and seeking the kingdom of God as David did. Moreover, verse 16 back in Matthew 6 earlier, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou, fa- but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast. Now notice, here's the principle. But unto thy God which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Just a question tonight before we move on. When is the last time that God gave you a promotion or God gave you a place of influence you did not have prior and you did nothing to earn it as far as gaining it or manipulating your way into it? Maybe a job gave, God gave you, a place of influence, a, a relationship that you're the leader in that relationship. God will reward those with influence uh, who first have an intimate relationship with him in private. Way too many people are trying to build a platform you know, that I, I'm known and recognized instead of just building a relationship with God, building a heart level relationship uh, with the Lord. And as we do so, he who sees in secret will reward us openly. God saw David long before chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. And while all the other political events were going on in the previous chapters, David was craft, learning his craft and developing a heart for God and, and, and positioning himself with God's help to be ready for what God had for him next. So our heart for God distinguishes us through preparation. Could it be the reason that you're not given more from God in the area of influence is because you're not preparing? Um, you're just waiting for something to happen, and something can happen, but it happens as a result of our preparation. All right, number two, look at verse 19. Go back to our text in 1 Samuel 16. And notice if you want verse 19, a second area that our heart for God distinguishes us as a leader. I love this part of the story. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly. Notice that. He loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. Um, and then verse 22, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 22, and Saul said to Jesse, saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was come upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Number two, our heart for God distinguishes us through our praise. So through our preparation, number two, through our praise. I heard the other day a mom was talking about how fast they go through dishes. Um, have you noticed that? Clothes and dishes. I mean, literally, we have three loads of laundry while the other loads are still finishing up. How's it even possible? We just finished emptying these, these uh, hampers. Same thing with dishes. And she was saying, we have seven people in our house, this mom was saying, and we get done with breakfast and we have 13 dirty cups. How does that happen? You know, <laughs> seven people and we have 13 cups that are dirty. Um, I think sometimes, if we're honest, we begin to be emptied out as the years go by. We lose heart for God, and the only way to sustain that is through praise. Um, I don't know about you, but I get discouraged about some of the trends of my own life and in the world around me, but if I can fix my heart upon God and praise Him, it renews me. It keeps my heart and vision fresh as I lead others that follow me. Let's talk about two praises that are fueled by a passion for God. What happens in the area of praise when we lead from a heart for God. Number one, a praising responsibility. And you see that in verse 19. I alluded to chapter 17, but did you catch that phrase? Wherefore Saul sent a messenger unto David, and in this official telegram or um, you know, scroll opened and read from the king to Jesse, it says, send me David thy son. And did you notice that phrase? Which is with the sheep. David was known as a responsible young man. Um, 
Saul knew when the letter arrived, which would have taken some time between the palace and transit to this household, that when it got there, David would be with the sheep. His praise uh, caused him to be responsible and to be tenacious in that responsibility. And in God's providence, he arranged this moment for this shepherd boy to literally be, go from the shepherd's field to the palace of the king, all because he had the right spirit as he did his responsibility. Now, David had already been anointed. He'd already been anointed, and he's still, verses later, he's still verses later with um, the sheep. And so we need to be more responsible as we praise and honor the Lord. Too many self-absorbed, ego-driven leaders try to force open opportunities. Only those praising an eternal God, only through praising an eternal God can we remain patient to let God open the doors of influence in His time and in His way. Stay on God. Stay praising Him and focusing on Him and waiting on Him to open those doors of opportunity. All right, secondly, number two, look at verse 20. So he brings these gifts to Saul, and you will notice in verse 21 it says, and he became his, his armor bearer. Number two, praising not only responsibility, but praising service. David, through praise and a heart of praise, became a servant of the king. Now, sequentially, I don't know that David in chapter 16 actually becomes this armor bearer. Um, David actually goes home for a time and then comes back to the palace. But the writer of uh, this book alludes to the fact that eventually David will have this position of being an armor bearer. He became a servant of the king, initially in his praise, ultimately became a warrior in the army of uh, Israel. And so we see this praise and worship of God offered to him opportunities of elevation. And you notice then in verse 22 and 23, as he plays, that this evil spirit from God, as David played, his, Saul's spirit is refreshed and the evil spirit departed. The spirit of God is working through David as he serves um, the king. Um, and that was a, a tradition of that time. They would often, when someone was troubled, they would have a heart played and they would maybe quote things or read things to try to push back those evil spirits. And so we see David through God's help, doing just that for Saul. The other day I saw a picture of, you ever, you know, the movie Toy Story? Have you heard of that Toy Story? There's a lot of deep spiritual truth in that uh, animated film. I don't know if there's or not. There's probably a lot of evil thoughts as well. Maybe that's your theory on it. But anyway, um, you know Woody, the cowboy, you know, that, that you pull the string back and then he says, you know, whatever, stick him up or whatever the cowboy thing he says. Um, that's not what he says. What does he say? I mean, what is it? Reach for the sky or something? Okay, see, there you go. There's a snake in my boots. Yeah, doesn't he say something like reach for the sky or something too? You, you partners or something? But anyway, uh, he, somebody had that picture and then they asked this question. We're getting off topic here, but anyway, just us. Uh, someone said this, quote, if my back had a pull string, what would be some of my catchphrases? What would I say over and over that you would expect me to say if you could yank back that string? What have you heard me say over and over and over again? And my question to you is this, those who love God are regularly praising Him. There's, there's a cycle to that. I praise Him and then I love Him anew and afresh. And because I love Him anew and afresh, I want to praise Him more in this cyclical interaction with God. And David clearly had that. And when the moment came, the crisis came, out of his heart and out of his spirit came this influence for the cause of Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you tonight, David did not become the sweet psalmist of Israel in this court. He became that long before this moment. He sustained that long after this moment through his personal relationship uh, with the Lord. <laughs> I lo love the verse in Acts 13, 36, where it says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. He served his own generation. And one of the ways he most effectively served his own generation were all of the Psalms and all of the praise that he penned and offered uh, as influence. Um, just a verse that came to mind as we're entering Thanksgiving, um, Psalm 100, the great 100th Psalm, says, Make ye a joyful noise in the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know ye the Lord, that he is God, and he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And notice these words, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. David walked into Saul's court with praise because he first had walked into God's presence with praise. It was a habit. It was a part of who he was. 
And when these moments came, it spilled out and gave him great influence for the glory and honor of God. As we finish tonight, would you look um, at verse 13? Now let's end here, kind of bring this to application tonight. Um, as we think about the heart of influence and what God would have us in this area as we influence others, look, if you will, at verse 13. All right, so you have the qualification of heart, you have the distinction of heart, and right in the middle, sandwiched between those two aspects of David, you notice in verse 13, then Samuel, after God says, arise and anoint him, for this is he. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren. That had to be an interesting moment. Um, as his brethren, their sneers, their looks down, etc. And then notice this, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now notice, if you will, in the beginning middle of the verse, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Now here's my question. What made David distinctive and what qualified him was not ultimately his heart. It was the Spirit of God. But here's the thought, or the question. Where does the Spirit reside? Where does the Spirit work out of in us? Is it our mind? Is it our hand? Is it our foot? Is it our body as a whole? No, it's what? It's our heart. Now, here's the thought before we finish tonight. The heart is not the end of our influence. It's not like if I get the heart right that then I become this amazing leader. What happens is the heart provides the context, the vessel that the Spirit can fill and do things that impact people. No one listening to you tonight, nobody getting influence of you, even you're saying the right thing, but they're drowning you out or distancing from you. Could it be tonight the issue is your heart is not refined, it's not open to the Spirit of God, and because the Spirit is not working through your heart, no one is listening. It ought to make a difference in your heart. It ought to challenge your heart and stir your heart, and as it does so, it will impact others. All right, let me give you this quote, and we'll finish tonight. I find this very powerful. If you want, kind of a psychobabble quote, I guess, but it does give us an implication. If you want to shine like the sun, first burn like the sun. You want to be someone of influence? Stop focusing on why no one's listening to me and why I don't have a place of influence, and start with your heart. Burn. Have a passion for God. Why aren't we leading souls to Christ? I, I will be the first to acknowledge this because I don't have as much passion for the gospel as I need. It's not about their blindness and their rejection and their rebellion. It's about I don't have a heart for it yet. And your parenting, your kids aren't listening to you. They're not doing what you want. Could it be you really don't have a heart for what you claim you have a heart for tonight? Same is true of your pastor tonight. Those not responding to the gospel. Do I love him? Do I love them? And do I want to see God's truth uh, be a part of their life? The Spirit of God dwells in the heart of the believer. We would do well to refine the heart to gain greater influence. God took the kingdom from Saul because he refused to live by the new heart that God had given him. He gave the kingdom to David because David was a man after God's own heart. David pleased God's heart because God pleased David's heart. Does God please your heart tonight? Do you just love him? Do you long for him? Do you desire to be closer to him? Those are the ones God wants representing him. Here's the question we're done. Will you develop a heart of influence for God that enables you to be more qualified and more distinct in your leadership? Let's pray together. Father, thank you tonight for your word.